And given that, I could presumably figure out how much the change in quantity is, yeah? And what else could I figure out if I upped the price? I could find out how much the government got, couldn't I? I mean, we now have 1.81. We're paying the producers 50 times 1.81. We're paying the government 100 minus 50, which is also 50 times 1.81. And so you could multiply this number, these numbers out. And if you didn't lose all the places, you could find out how much money that would generate. The reason why I asked you to go find out the budget for the state of Montana is that that might be a major part of the whole budget for the state of Montana. So when you go to do a tax on something you don't like, say coal-fired electricity, you got two things that are, are coming at you. One thing that's coming at you is you're not going to take it to zero, even with really big changes in prices. But you will get some effect. The second thing that's coming at you in these energy things is really huge quantities of money. That's not easy to deal with. And what would you do if you were California and you sold about 40 billion? And again, I'm always worried about my decimal points, but I think it's about right. Gallons of gasoline a year. And you were to tax them a dollar each. That's $40 billion. What's our state budget? It's about $100 billion. So a good size tax on something that produces externalities like gasoline is going to have a huge effect on your state budget. Just huge. And what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make it work? I leave that as a question. What are you going to do? Let's suppose you got people to agree, or you want to get people to agree, what's up the gasoline tax? We really think gasoline produces a lot of evils. It's not nice to refine it. It's not nice to dig it up. Um, it's not nice to breathe it after we, you know, after we burn it. So why don't we up the tax on it? It's a very reasonable way to, to work. Europeans do that. Um, they have gasoline prices over double ours. When I left Sweden uh, in August, the price was about $10 a gallon. Um, right? That's going to pull in a huge amount of money. What are you going to do? Yeah, come on, somebody got an idea. Yeah. Well, well, okay. So, so you know, the, the kind of democratic answer is there are all these underfunded programs, and people really love them, and we will spend more. We'll spend the forty bill. Um, do you think you can get that passed in California? Do you think you could find forty billion dollars worth of programs that you could fund in California off a of gasoline tax and have more than, than half the population say this is a good idea? They're mostly saying no because they remember the tax revolt started here, and we say taxes. Well, oh, it's the third rail. Don't touch it. Right? That's not gonna work. Um, you might be able to get away with a little bit. I mean, the money from the cap and trade program they are going to do that with i don't know if they'll survive the next election they're going to dump a bunch of money into their high speed train that i predict will be ready when you're older than i am and they're going to um, dump some of it into social welfare that got heavily defunded over the last several years so what's the alternative yeah, go ahead. well you, you want to be careful you want to you want to in some sense give them money but make them face the higher prices so you want them to change from driving four hours to going skiing to taking those dance classes they've always wanted. Right? You gotta change their behavior, you don't get anywhere. If I remember the California statistics right, across the various income classes and income quintiles, uh, gasoline was something between four and five percent of, in, you know, of income. Gas uh, energy expenditure of that sort. So actually across California, it's pretty flat um, in percentage. Yeah. So you want to just give them the money in a check. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's the predominant, I'll get you a second, the next. Uh, that, that's the predominant thought. It's, oh, look, we raised the money from taxing illegal gasoline, and so we should be stuffing the money into our high-speed trains. That's literally what they're thinking. Now, there's strange things about how the California legislature works and when you need a supermajority and when you don't. And so it's actually linked in California by law, which it isn't in other places. So if I have a program and it generates fees for some kind of environment thing, and I use those fees for the same purpose, then we classify it as a fee, not a tax, and it just has different legal consequences. But we're alone among the 50 states in that. Because we have these supermajority things. Remember, 50% of the legislature isn't in control. You have to get much more than that to actually be in control and do what you want. And so that's the tax limitation stuff. So if you have something and you can get it out of this box called tax, then you've taken it out of the box called tax limitation. And it's procedurally easier to get something done. Okay? And that's just our own craziness. No one else in the world has this. This is hours and hours alone. Um, but generally, I, I find that an obnoxious answer, personally. I, I'm aware with the answer of, wait a minute, there are people at the bottom of the income scale, and we at least should hold one to the bottom of the income scale, even. We should do something that's good for them that doesn't get them to consume more energy, but something that's good for them. Personally, I go that way. Um, the majority opinion is yours. A absolutely, that's the majority opinion. Okay, so th this, is, this is the problem of, I have a Vita. I put published articles on the Vita. So I have two problems, personally. You know, do I tell useful pieces of truth that might help society, and do I get things published? My personal incentives would be pushed toward to get things published. So I should write cute, simple articles that get published quickly, because that will buff up my Vita and make my salary go up, and I will be able to consume more airplane trips and more carbon. I mean, whatever I do with it. Okay? And everybody up and down the line has that incentive. All the administrators at our university, they have to have an initiative. So if you became the provost, and you had a choice between taking some money and funding English 1A so every student can get English 1A and 1B or, you know, reading in comp 1A, 1B in their first year, no problem. Or starting a brand new writing center. We're going to have writing across the curriculum and writing will become important and which is going to go on your Vita. I mean, one is called taking care of business. How do you put that on your Vita? I became the provost and I focus on our core business and I'd like to be your chancellor. As opposed to, I started a new writing center and we had the following great results and all will fall apart before the guy's even out of here. Um, 
and that's the way it works. And so if you're the governor, you know, what are they going to remember me for? They're going to remember me because I kicked a little more money under the table and the port line got completed to San Jose and they were able to figure out how to have hangers in the cars. You can hang your bikes and they won't bash people up. Um, geez, you know, what kind of an accomplishment is that? So the political system and the system at work and everywhere pushes you away from your core business. That's when you hear these guys saying with core business, that's what they're fighting. They're not crazy. They're fighting this desire of everyone below them to not push to make money with their core business, but to have this new great thing. And that's what, that's what the desire is. And that's what you're fighting. And I'm with you. You know, I can think of a hundred transportation projects in California that will save me more carbon and get people there faster. Um, but that's not going to make anyone famous. Yeah. So, so you would, if, if, you, if, if it worked right, if it worked right and you invested in other modes, so let's say Beijing, so originally poor people rode bicycles and everyone got rich and started riding the bus and the subway, and then they got even richer and they went out and got cars, and we're still talking about trips that average five kilometers flat. You know how long it takes to do five kilometers flat on a bike? I mean, you barely can get on and off the bike. You can barely walk to the bus stop and wait on line. You'd be there faster on your bike. But once you don't invest in it, what happens? There's no place to ride the bike. You need to go. So they start going back and taking space away from the cars and reinstituting the bike lanes. So you can actually ride the 5K flat and they'll get you out of their car and out of their subway and off of their bus for all the smaller trips. You've got to put money in it. And then in that scenario, everyone goes faster. So absolutely everyone's made better off. You know, for some reason you live way out there and you have to drive your car, you get saved 20 minutes a day and an amazing number of purses. And you're willing to pay for this. You are made better off by them doing it. And that's, that's the way that's supposed to work. Uh, operationally, what happens is more people show up and they clog the roads again. But <laughs> I, I can't hear you. you got to shout. Wait, 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 there's too much in there. <laughs> and I didn't hear it all. Let me, let me take some pieces of it. So electricity generation was privatized, at least the uh, merchant fossil fuel plants, on the belief that there were many, many, many of them that would work as a competitive industry and it would get the right answer in terms of people would enter when they were cheaper. In fact, there were too few of them and there were too many ways for them to gain the system and it didn't work out. Before privatization of generation, not distribution, that's still held publicly, or sorry, that's still regulated, they were regulated. And they were given just so much money for their electricity based on what it cost them to produce it. Um, and in prospect, if you'd ask an economist, should we privatize this, they would say, yes! And in retrospect, if you actually worked on it, which I had the privilege of doing for the state of California, you'd say, well, things didn't work out the way we expected. Maybe it wasn't such a great idea after all. <laughs> I'm not sure that answers your question, but you can later get closer right here and you can, you can ask the whole, the whole thing. Um, so anything else you want to do with the money? What else you do with the money? Okay, so let's go back to taxation. Remember your basic taxation model? In your basic taxation model, do people like to be taxed? No. Surprise! All right. So. If I tax them over here on their gasoline that produces an externality, why can't I just take some of that money and untax them on their labor? And that's a, tax, a reasonable tax rate. You could do that. We don't do it. The Swedes do do it. They took their um, taxes for all things environmental. And I mean, there's a tax for digging stuff out of the ground. So all the environmental things you think people do wrong, you think of as creating externalities, they tax them. They took the money. They're a high tax world, by the way. But they took the money and they removed their highest tax on income and they removed their taxes on wealth, which were obnoxious, um, and they reduced their property taxes quite a bit, and now they're gonna have a new left-wing government and they'll rejigger that a little bit. So the way they did it gave more money to the people at the top and the people at the bottom, and the new government that's slightly to the left of center will undoubtedly find a way to jigger that so the guys at the top pay a little more and the guys at the bottom pay a little less. But basically they took the money and dumped it into reducing taxes that were otherwise very high. That's an alternative. Mm -hmm. you want something more on that? No? Yeah? I, I don't know any way to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, you, can you have a sane conversation about taxes? No, what will happen? People will start throwing food, right? <laughs> and you'll, you'll just get drowned out by, um, Reagan told us, you know, read my lips, no new taxes, right? And Reagan must have been right, and you're still locked in. I mean, eventually, when your roads crumble, um, and your kids can't go to school anymore, you'll say, oh, there are these things called taxes. It's amazing. <laughs> but I think you have a while to go. And who likes them? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've heard it, but I don't know anyone else who likes them more than we do. Um, but still, suppose you hated them, and you had a choice of paying taxes on gasoline or taxes on your labor. Well, why is hating taxes going to make you care which of the two you get? That I don't get. But the, the, you know, we don't have a conversation. I mean, everywhere else in the world we have a conversation about um, you know, taking in the tax money and sticking it out to reduce some other tax that's obnoxious. And we don't seem to be able to have it. Academics have a conversation endlessly. No, wait, wait. The demand for gasoline, two things are happening. Right. One thing is, you're up here, right? No, we're, we're down here, and the price goes up, and I'm up there, and now my gasoline's come down. And then they reduce the tax on labor, and that gives me more disposable income, and it shifts my demand curve outwards, because gasoline's a normal good. And so I give up presumably part of that. Unless the income elasticity for gasoline is immense, in which case it works backwards, and I'm worse off. And indeed, uh, Robert and Williams estimated essentially that. How much will the demand for gasoline shift out if I have additional labor income? And the effect is, is very noticeable. So you're not going to save the entirety. You're going to give some of that back. That's correct. Anything else?
Okay, then goodbye. <laughs> forgot where we needed to be. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I, I just forgot to point out some schedule. I, I do want you to disappear, but I, I want you, before you disappear, to realize where I will not be so you don't come looking for me. Um, and I put it at the top here. I should have done this at the beginning. Um, so if you look, you'll see I'm gone both this Friday and next Friday. So I have office hours after class. I'm always open to your emailing me to find a time. This Wednesday morning, I don't have anything else. If you want to come in, send me an email, and I'll make it here by, if I had to 9, prefer 10 for you. Um, Tuesday, next week, I could see you at 11 if you really wanted. And then I'm really gone until the Monday after. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>